I'm Phil Gallagher, and in this edition of Burlington Life, we're going flying at Burlington's airfield. Year-round, the skies over Mary Cummings Park are abuzz with the sights and sounds of remote control model aircraft. Since the 1960s, model flying buffs have been taking to the wild blue yonder here at Flyers Field, where we spoke with members of the Burlington Radio Controlled Flyers, Inc. Burlington RC Flyers President Howard Samuels. Explain to us what RC Flyers is. Well, we're flying planes, we're flying helicopters, we're flying drones, multi-rotors. People call them drones, but they're all drones. And we have electric ones, we have gas-powered ones, we have glow fuel, which is what you remember from the 60s, 70s, 80s. This field now is actually an airport. You can, you can find it on aeronautical charts. We have a, a letter on file with the Bedford Air Traffic Control Tower. So they know that we're here. We have certain flight restrictions and area restrictions that we can fly in. Now, this is Mary Cummings Park. Uh, what is the arrangement that you have formerly with the, with the City of Boston and now with the trustees? Mary Cummings Park was given to the City of Boston in a trust. And it was the intent was for the kids in Boston who didn't have a place to get outside and enjoy nature, that they could all come here. Unfortunately, there's no transportation that they can take to get here. So it's really been something that the city hasn't paid a lot of attention to. Except when they tried to sell it. That's right. They, <laughs> they tried to sell it to developers and so on, but the trust was pretty well written. We're very fortunate that way. Take it off! So the trustees were granted, I guess, stewardship. We have, we have an agreement with the trustees. They think that this open field and this vista here is an appeal of the park. So they made a picnic lawn just uphill from here so that people can sit up there and watch us fly the planes. I work during the week, so I'm here on weekend mornings usually. We have a lot of retired members who are here whenever the weather's best during the week as well. Because of the orientation of the runways, the mornings are better because the sun is behind our back, mm -hmm. so you don't have the sun in your eyes when you're flying. As an electric engineer, Howard has a broad interest in the hobby. I looked around and I found the Burlington RC Flyers website, and it's actually on my way to work. So I stopped by there one day and met a bunch of people flying on the weekend. They were all very friendly guys. The multi-rotors were just beginning, so I, I became excited about that. I got into flying wing kind of planes, military planes, and I got into helicopters as well. Not multi-rotors, but actual helicopters. I'm an engineer, so I do, I do like messing around with the computer and fine-tuning, that sort of thing. The basic airplanes are more craftsman, hobby type thing. You can build them from scratch, you can buy kits, you can buy ones that are almost ready to fly, just put your electronics in there, make sure the center of gravity is right, and you can, you can fly it that way. Some people like to fiddle with engines, whether it's in their car or on the airplane. So there's all different sorts of aspects of the hobby that different people take out of it. I like to make, I like to build and fly different kinds of drones. Of course, you can go to Best Buy and pick up a drone there and fly it and uh, do some photography. That's what most of the drones that you buy in the store are for photography, aerial photography, videos and, and selfies and things. Here's an example of a kind of home-built drone and you can add GPS onto it, you can put cameras on it, you can put gimbals. Right now I'm using this as instruction for people who want to learn drones because it is easier to fly. The race quads and the higher performance quads. These are made of carbon fiber, so they're a little bit lighter. This is very thick carbon fiber, this particular one. It's very rigid, extremely rigid. I, can't, I can barely flex it at all with, with a lot of force there. This one has red LEDs in the back, white LEDs in the front, as if you're driving a car. Anytime I want to put LEDs to help me with the orientation of something, I do that because it's easy to remember. On a race quad, you don't need that because you're not looking at the quad, you're looking through the camera in the quad. Something that you're flying aer aerobatically and you're, and you're watching it, I like to know the orientation. This is very small, it's very easy to get the orientation mixed up without the lights. And as soon as that happens, you might think you want to be going one way and it's facing you and it'll not end up going the other way and crash very quickly. <laughs> the micro quads that you fly indoors, sometimes they're 3D printed, sometimes they're made of plastic. This one uh, might look a little bit more familiar. It's a racing drone. There's a, there's a video camera in the front. You wonder why the camera's sort of pointing up because the drone is always moving forward very quickly and the camera's facing straight forward when it's doing that. This is small, it's pretty light. There are four fairly powerful motors on it, so it does go fast, it can turn very quickly. These two little antennas are for receiving the signals from my radio. 
the remote controller. And this antenna is the video transmitter to go back to me. It's not HD video, it, it goes to my goggles. So when I'm flying this for a race, I would go through obstacles and, and around things. Whereas if I were looking at a distance, there's no way I could be 50 yards away and go through a small loop without having the view of being in the drone itself. That's called first person video. Club member David Iodice also shares an enthusiasm for many aspects of RC flying. I was looking for a new hobby, something new to get into, and at the time aerial photography was starting to become a very popular thing and I figured I would try it out. I would see what, uh, what it took to get into it. My specialty specialty is the drones, specifically aerial photography. I, I got very, very into it. I, I loved like going out to parks, flying over lakes, because you get a view of nature and you get a view of the world through a drone that you wouldn't get any other way. So that, that's sort of what was what brought me into the hobby and really kept me in because I, I really look forward to getting, finding a good place and getting those really, really beautiful shots. So are you using the GPS to pre-program your route and things of that sort? I have seen people use that. I like to be in control at all times. That's the fun of it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, why have, the, why have the drone fly itself when I can control it and have it do exactly what I want? Plus, you get those, those exact precise shots that, you know, no matter how good the GPS is, it might not be able to put the drone in the exact location you want it to. So what we have is sort of a whole spread of pretty much everything that I do that has to do with RC flying. Um, I do a little bit with what people consider the typical drones. Over here is an Autel Evo, which is the small one over here, and then an Autel Explorer over there, which is sort of their older model, but still fun to fly. Those are the ones that people usually get those like nice swooping shots with and, and really beautiful aerial views, steady camera. And it, it's typically what most people think of immediately when people say the word drone. On the other side over here, this is what you'll see more often with the club. This is a model of a Trojan. It's a very, very fun plane to fly. A lot of the guys in the club have planes more similar to this than anything else. And in fact, the reason that I purchased this plane in particular is one of the events that the club holds every year is called a Warbird Day, where the club members bring all of their historical planes. You know, we have Mustangs, Spitfires, all sorts of like really fun, you know, beautiful looking World War II, World War I era planes. That's part of what the club is for, you know, it's for holding these kind of events. It's for bringing all of us together so that we can show off each other's planes, fly together. Uh, sort of in the middle here is where I drift into my DIY version of drones. What people sort of don't know until you dive into the hobby. This right here is a fully assembled drone that is fully programmable. I, I can hook it up to my laptop and I can change how it flies, I can change how it responds. It's very much full touch, but unlike the aerial photography, it, it's controlled completely by controller. There's no GPS stabilization, there's no automatic return to home. If you lose it, it's lost. The camera in the front here feeds directly into these goggles. These goggles have a little bit of a uh, camera in the front and it feeds the video directly into here so you get that feeling like you're actually flying. It's, it's amazing. Ooh. And then over here is, uh, this is my project in the works. Similar to how you would buy a, uh, a kit for a go-kart or a kit for a car or something like that, you, you buy all of your parts. And the great thing about this is that each part is chosen by me for a specific purpose. Everything is unique here. And when I put it together, it's going to be a drone that is completely unique to me, that, that I fully assembled. Over here is the, the board, this is the brains. Everything sort of connects to that. This is the motor. This right here is the camera, and the frame is right over here. And I'll probably spend a weekend soldering this all up together so that it'll be very similar to this drone right here when I'm done. Now, have you had any problems with birds attacking your drone while you're in these locales? No, never, <laughs> no, no. No hawks coming down on them? No, no. Um, you'll, see them, you'll see them get curious, and they'll, they'll sort of, uh, 
they'll sort of show you uh, show you that they're not afraid, but they'll never come near you. And you're all electric, I presume? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. So tell us a little bit about the financial operation of the club. There's dues, I presume? Yep. The club is almost fully funded by its members. It's basically one of those things that helps drive the club. It allows us to mow the field, it allows us to take care of the property here, and it also allows us to do specialized events. So back before the pandemic started, we had the chili frozen finger fly. Yeah, say that five <laughs> times fast. <laughs> yeah, really. Chili frozen finger fly. So the dues allowed us to bring down some food and, and have a good time while we uh, brought some members down. Our president won't eat food unless it's from McDonald's, so nobody's <laughs> poisoning him, right? It gives us a, an opportunity to do events yeah. like those for the members. New member events as well, and I understand you have a raffle and things of that sort. Oh, of course, a yeah. A plane or a drone raffled off? Every single meeting we have some sort of raffle. Usually it's a plane or sometimes it might be a drone. The raffles at the club are, are more designed to give our members something additional to look forward to. We actually break even on those raffles more often than not. We're sort of very fortunate. We have our low costs, so we don't, we don't have to spend that much money. We take care of the field and through a lot of volunteer work and a lot of donations, we end up taking very good care of the field. The other thing that we do to sort of help do fundraisers is we hold auctions. So it's, it's a nice way to sort of not only, you know, sell your stock because some of the guys have just tons of planes hanging out in their, in their garage. It's a good way to reduce what you have so you can buy new stuff. And it also gives other pilots an opportunity to fly something that they wouldn't normally have purchased. Doug Murray specializes in RC helicopters and has become quite the aficionado of radio-controlled choppers in his 15 years with the club. With this RPM... RC helicopters are one of the more complex craft to learn to fly, and Doug started out by training himself on a simulator. This, this radio is set up just like in real life, so that my fingers and my brain are basically trained, you know, they stay connected with the helicopter. So the, the simulation's the same. Just before I bought my helicopter, I was, I was flying the simulator probably a good, probably another six months. And the simulator I actually self-taught myself how to fly. My first time going out and flying my helicopter, I was really nervous. I was all by myself, you know, beginner. I didn't know what this thing was gonna do. And, but you know, I did all my research. And then as I progressed into the hobby, I, I used to just do a lot of training where, you know, different orientations, I would just sit there Day after day, I'd have my helicopter hovering on side view, nose view, tail in, and, and start making boxes and, and, and really pushing the limits of what I was learning. And I seemed to progress a lot faster when I was making myself feel a little more uncomfortable with it. If you don't push yourself in this, this hobby a little, so, you know, with helicopters, if you really want to progress, you really have to push yourself out of that box, you know, and, and, and feel that, you know, it's like, it's like when you first do your first maneuver, when I did my first loop, really gets the adrenaline run, rushing and you get nervous. You know, you have to learn how to work through that. When you freeze up, your hands don't work so well. So when you're learning and pushing yourself into that, where you're nervous or you have a fear of crashing, it gets a little easier as time goes on because, you know, you get the confidence and and your flying just gets smoother and, and better. I like fast and low. And I do a lot of crazy maneuvers that are very difficult that take takes time to, to learn how to do and I just feel challenged. So I'm always pushing myself for that extreme maneuver. We call that 3D flying. So in the helicopter, we will have like 3D smack. So you bring it down the helicopter on the deck and do flips and rolls low on the deck, people think, you know, oh, he's gonna crash or, or whatever, but it's all controlled. And I don't know, I, I think I'm a fast, and you know, people that don't know what the helicopter is, they, you know, they're like, oh, look at this, he's gonna crash or, you know, it's crazy, but it's it's all in control. And it's just a lot of practice. Some of the moves I, I learned for 3D, it's six months, you know, it takes me six months to really feel confident about how I'm flying to be bringing it out on the field because Helicopters are very expensive to repair. You know, on average cost for a 700 helicopter, you know, where the blades, the rotor blades on those helicopters are over $100.
you know. So you're looking at about 250 to, you know, even up, depending on, you know, what it is. And I find that with the helicopter pilots in the hobby, there's so much at stake that they really fly really well. So there's no, I don't see many helicopter guys when I go to the local events that are, you know, hey, first day at the helicopter and just go out to fly. No, they, they've been there practicing and they're very serious, dedicated to the hobby, so. You know, it's funny because people will say, can you fly slow, you know? And, and to be honest, you know, I can fly slow. And when nobody's around, it, I'll do a lot of that practice stuff. I'll pick a small place, a small area. I used to fly in my backyard. I do like just nose in circuits, you know, just yeah. changing the orientations and challenging myself that way slow. But, you know, I would put out cones and, you know, use the cones as different like areas where I would want to stop, change the direction and, you know, just to have a, you know, 100% control of that or as close as I could to 100% control. So, you know, if I want that helicopter to be in a certain area, first few times, I'm going to overshoot it or, you know, the wind could blow and I could lose orientation on it. So it's definitely challenging to fly slow. For Club Vice President Holger Wurz, RC flying is a family affair with his two sons, Jonas and Ben. A couple of summers ago, uh, my son Benjamin here is, got really interested in the YouTube craze of flight tests. It's an organization, they, they promote flight and RC flying, and they get, make it really easy to enter the hobby with very cheap materials. So if you see the plane over there, that's built out of foam board, just poster board. And so it's really easy to get into the hobby for, for relatively low coin. And so we started building, and a couple of summers and winters, we just built planes in the basement. Uh, at some point, we ran out of space on our local soccer field, and we decided we should join the club. And so we, we came up here to Burlington and, and met a couple of people and just joined up. And we've been here just about every weekend since February. <laughs> Always wanted to fly, but I was never able to do it. My parents weren't into this and they thought it was a big waste of money, which, I, you know, we all admit it is. <laughs> but it's great fun. So now with my kids being that age, I'm, I'm living out the dream that, you know, that, that I've had as a kid. But just a little push, right? You don't have to go full, full push. Jonas, he's almost ready to fly. Very nice, very nice. You know, Ben is more interested in the building part of things, so he really likes more of the putting the things together and, you know, crafting in the basement. And uh, he's into photography, so he's taken, he's doing a lot of videography and photography about, of our planes, so we do more of that. You know, we are, we're all having fun. I've only been flying since February, so I'm, I'm still learning myself, so. <laughs> Burlington RC Flyers Board of Directors member Pranav Biskitwala Taking off on the upper has his own unique perspective on RC flying. <laughs> Prof, tell us first of all uh, how you developed an interest in flying. Um, I'm a radio frequency engineer with the T-Mobile. So I and I also love the airplanes. So these two things like kind of go together. So yeah, that's how I entered into a hobby. I love flying planes and I've done the real flight lessons. This is the closest to like flying a real plane because these wings are with the camera. Uh -huh. So I can virtually be in the cockpit. I can have the HD camera recording. Okay, so that comes right down to your radio controller. You have a, you have a video screen right on your controller? Yeah. So it's like virtual reality, only it's it's only it's reality, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, how yeah. do you, is this your fly joystick up here? No, this is the receiving antenna, oh, like video receiving antenna, and this is the transmitter. This is the GPS. I see. This has pretty good range, like one mile, but we are good to cover this field. So I try to be close, and in case I lose the signal or something happens, I can flip the switch, and with this GPS, it will come back and start loitering around. The flying wing, essentially, this is like the, the B2 construction, right? Uh, yep. And this is electric, so your yep. lith lithium battery here? Uh, no, battery goes in here. This is the electronic speed controller, so that controls the motor. And this is the brain of this wing. Okay. So. And this is a pusher prop, not a puller prop, right? Yeah, it's pusher prop, so it's okay. safer than the prop in the front. Right. <laughs> Right. And what is your construction material here? Is this composite or is this foam? Uh, this is foam, 
and these are like balsa. So it's right. a tough construction. Even if I hit, hit the ground like 20, 30 miles an hour, it, I can fly it right back again. But that's not the object though, right? That's the, not the <laughs> object. Hit the ground no. at 30 miles an hour. And what is the top speed on this rig? The, with this one, uh, 4S, 4,000 milliamp hour, I recorded uh, 116 miles an hour. 116 miles an hour. So how long have you been flying? Taking off on the upper. Uh, it's been one and a half year. Uh -huh. So this club is very friendly. Like when I joined, like I didn't know flying, I just had the interest. This is the bungee launcher. Oh, I see. So okay, I so you don't need hook. wheels. Yeah. And then just uh, put it on top. You snap it off with an elastic? And that's the bungee, yeah. Yeah. Uh, by sitting on this chair, I can just pull it. Uh, I can either wear my goggle from the beginning or just pull it pull down. Put it on when you're going. And then Crazy. keep flying. Beautiful. Now, what do you have for competitions up here? Do you have dog fights? In the old days, they used to trail a uh, like a kite tail of, yeah, of paper. Yeah, a streamer. And, yeah, we, we do that every now and then. We have we have competition day, and the, the object is to cut the other guy's streamer. And that's surprisingly hard to do. It's very tough. I've never successfully cut somebody else's streamer. We also do like physical contact with some of the planes. Some of the planes are designed a little bit better than others to withstand an impact. So it, the rule is like, you know, just little love bumps, you know, no, uh, no hard hits, you know, keep it clean. <laughs> we did that last year. And usually what happens is you wait a few years until people end up with some planes that are kind of beat up and they don't really care about all that much. Right, right, <laughs> and then, right. then you have the competition day. Yeah. Do you have air, air, air collisions frequently in that game? It's surprisingly hard to do. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we, we had one last year, and at one point, you know, one guy was saying, okay, look, I'm just going to fly in a gentle circle, and you try to hit me, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> that being said, we've had a couple of mid-air collisions inadvertently of just people flying here. We've hosted a photographer's day where what's really cool is it, it sort of brings two hobbies together. A lot of our guys are photographers too. We have this little competition to see who can, you know, photograph the model planes the best. We do a challenge day where pilots are challenged to do things that they wouldn't normally do, you know, backflips, barrel rolls. We also have done heli days where we invite people from other clubs to bring the helicopters and we make a whole event out of it. I am a team pilot for Heli Direct. My flying style has progressed so much that I made it on the team for our team Heli Direct and we call them fun flies in the hobby. There's a lot of guys that we, you know, get pushed by but where we want to try to compete with every every time we see them. We always want to have the better flight, you know? We did have competitions. We had like an auto rotation contest who could basically cut the grass, you know? Auto rotation contests, we had prizes for. We had raffles, we had music. It was, it was just a great day when, you know, lots of pilots from different areas would come and we all flew together. So we painted targets on the grass for the auto rotation contest and then we would kill the motor and we'd probably be up 400 feet, or, you know, up there anyways. We'd shut the power off. Whoever landed closest to the target won the contest. So it was three best, you know, three shots at it. It was good. Okay, I was cool. lucky that day. <laughs> We've had cookouts. It, it just tons of events that we, we try to host at least one per month to get as many people down to the field all at once at one time. What do you do here for safety in terms of the both the spectators and the players? You're not supposed to walk on the runway. We have a procedure for how you fly. You call out, you know, taking off on the upper runway, take off on the lower runway. I'm on the runway, I'm clear, that sort of thing. So you have to yell it out so all the other pilots know that you're there. If somebody's flying, they can't look down on, or they may not look down and see that you're sitting there picking up your plane on the runway. Yeah. For spectators, they're not supposed to go on the runway. We just got a new sign asking people to look up and, and please don't go on the runways when there are planes in the air. And when somebody's flying, if somebody comes out onto the runway, club members will look and say, there's people on the runway. Mm -hmm. So we'll fly in a different location and, and we'll try to talk to the people and educate them about where it is safe to walk and where you should avoid. Checking off. If you were going to start, what's the first device and what's the first craft that you would recommend to a beginner? What I would recommend is that the beginner come to the field and talk to us 
and, and ask for recommendations, you know, because the, the technology changes, the, the planes change a lot. I brought a plane today called a Timber. It's a high wing foam plane with, with big wheels, so it, it's, it's pretty easy to fly. And, and to land. And to land, <laughs> and and now there are, there are several new versions of it, and, and the one that we have here, it's it's you can come to the field and you can try this one. Oh, you know, I always look at the club as you know we want to bring in members, and you know we just want to make sure that you know the hobby progresses, and you know we all have fun and flying together and the same passion. It's a great time. First off, you you get that sense of community around it when you're with a group of people that do the same thing, that when you, when you crash, they share your pain. When, when you do something successful for the first time, they share your excitement. It's the sense that you share those moments with people. And that to me is at the core of what the club is. I've looked at the one in Bilrica too, um, and it just looked like there was a lot of trees. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas this seemed to be, be a bigger field. I, I would love for people to come here and, and visit and, and talk and learn about the hobby. We provide free instruction if you come here and if you'd like to just try and fly a plane. On the buddy box with the two radios, you're welcome to do, do that as well. And what time do you start on, on the weekends? Usually on the weekends, we're here from maybe 9 to 12. Okay, so that's a good time to come on Saturday yeah, or Sunday? absolutely. We had a great time visiting Flyers Field, learning the many facets of RC flying and what the Burlington RC Flyers are all about. The Burlington RC Flyers make it easy to learn how to fly, from training to certification to building your own RC aircraft. The Burlington Radio Control Flyers invites people of all ages to Flyers Field at Mary Cummings Park year-round, where you'll find them showing their wares. Members are always more than happy to discuss the hobby with those interested. And for more on how you can start flying and become a part of the Burlington RC Flyers, go to burlington-rcflyers.com. For Burlington Life, I'm Phil Gallagher.